thinking a bit big picture, a bit different. So would you say that we're, and I think kind of from our earlier conversation, we are the first generation almost that has kind of had this because yes. like a hundred years ago, and it, we may not be like the first generation, but it takes a bit of time for people to think about these kind of things. And so maybe the first generation that's thinking about it. Um, so what do you see this meaning for the world? Um, you know, how can we make better use of wisdom in middle age? Because at the moment, as you say, especially in tech, like 30, <laughs> 35. Uh, 35 you know, is over the hill. He's over the hill, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's a great question, Richard. Um, one of the things, I wrote a book a few years ago called Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder, based upon my Airbnb experience. Um, and what I really wanted to try to do, and, and I've, continue to try to do is to help companies realize the value of older workers in the workplace. Um, there's a lot of myths like, oh, they're more expensive. Well, they're not always more expensive, frankly, because sometimes they want to work four days a week or three days a week, and they're willing to take a 20% or a 40% cut in pay based upon compared to full-time. But what I really wanted to help people to see was like the, the value of intergenerational collaboration we have five generations in the workplace for the first time. And in the U.S., as of next year, the majority of Americans will have a younger boss. I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> what I really want to help the world see is in a world in which people by choice or necessity are going to be working longer. Um, how do we tap into that wisdom? And how do we help? you know, older or mid midlife workers or older workers to constantly evolve their learning processes. So they're constantly learning something new. You know, if you're stuck and you're unwilling to learn, you're going to be, your job's going to be at risk. But mm -hmm. if you show up with a curiosity and a passionate engagement for the work you're doing, people won't notice your wrinkles as much as they will notice your energy. And that energy is what people will say, like, I like being near that person. I don't, I, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I came up with a, a term in my book, Learning to Love Midlife, called age fluid. Mm. And there, there's a, a term, you know, called gender fluid, which is like, you're not, it's hard to define what gender you are. Age fluid is similar in the sense that you don't know the age of the person. If you sort of feel their energy, you feel like their curiosity and their passion, you're like, I don't know your age. I don't know your generation. What I know is like, I can feel your curiosity, your energy, and how deeply committed you are to what you're interested in. And I'm really drawn to that. And um, when I was at Airbnb, I was so much older than everybody there. And I could have quickly like run for the hills thinking like, I'm a fool. I, these people know so much more than me. I do about technology. But I realized that I needed to be a mentor, a mentor and an intern at the same time. I was supposed to learn from them about certain things, and then I was supposed to teach them certain things. And that's really how it worked. So, so America has like the, some of the most equal opportunity laws, the, the strongest equal opportunity laws, I think, probably even more than Europe. But, but the, is age in there? I mean, do you see this happening? Do you see that companies are willing to hire older people at the moment? It's really hard. Here's the challenge. There's, it's called EEOC. And it's a, um, it says that after 40, you're a protected class. Meaning if it's proven that you have experienced ageism, you can, you can file a, a suit, a lawsuit. The problem is it's really, really hard to, to, um, mm. to prove. And the vast majority of people who say I was aged out of the workplace um, be purely because of my age and not because of something else, it it most people go through that process and they don't win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the good news is that we live in a culture in the United States right now and many many places in the world where there's a there's a fear of immigration. There's fear of bringing new people in. 
Now that's not a good thing. I think freaking immigration can be a great thing, a great for a society. And for the U.S., it has probably been one of the number one ways the U.S. differentiates itself from the rest of the world is the sheer volume of people who want to live in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But with tighter immigration standards means you have lower unemployment. And if you have lower unemployment, you have a challenge as an employer to figure out how the heck are we going to fill all the positions we have. So one of the greatest opportunities there is not figuring out how do you go hire people? How do you retain people? Mm. How do you retain workers, especially older workers <clears throat> who may want to stay in the workplace longer than they have a generation ago? And that's yeah. true. If you're going to live longer, you may say, you know, I'm not retiring at 62. I'm going to stay in the workplace till 72. Mm -hmm. Now, what companies haven't done yet is to figure out, okay, People are going to stay from 62 to 72 and we want them to stay, but how do you make sure that they're effective in their work and they feel engaged and they're not experiencing ageism from other employees? That is a whole opportunity <laughs> that we have yet to figure out. But I actually think we're sort of at the point where HR departments in companies are at least curious about this. And when I started right when I wrote my book, um, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elders six years ago, most HR company, most HR departments were not curious. They are now. Interesting. Well, that's good news. Yeah, because because there is demographic issues. I mean, like there's not replacement, native replacement birth rate almost anywhere in now. Lots of places. In lots of well, places. no, there's some. No, no, no. There's um, some places. in in, in, yeah. in in the Middle East. There's certain places yeah, where it yeah. is. There's there there is. Oh gosh, where else? There's a few other places. Probably Africa. But in, yeah. Yeah, definitely in Africa. Um, and and I'm, I'm forgetting about a couple other places, but in Asia, oh my God, Korea, like China, Japan, oh geez, these are places that are going to have twenty or forty percent less people in their population forty years from now than they have today. So, what would you see is the is the process of becoming a mentor. Actually, I, I kind of like your ment, ment intern, <laughs> ment, mentor, 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 mentor phrase. Yeah. Um, that, so can you talk a little bit about what that was like as a, 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 a mentor? So mentor means that you're, you recognize that you have some wisdom that you want to share. That's the mentor part. And then you're an intern and that, means that you're ready to learn. You're ready to be mm. curious. You're ready, ready to be the dumbest person in the room. And um, to actually be both curious, to be both wise and curious is a quality that all of us should have at any age, but particularly relevant for us as we get older, because it surprises someone when they realize that you're curious at age 60. Um, and it's it's almost like you're playing against the stereotype. And so, um, you know, I, when I talk to, we have over 4,000 people who've come through MEA and I, like one of my greatest pieces of advice is, you know, be curious, be a beginner over and over again, because it's probably the number one way you will live a good, healthy, longer life. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I must admit, I think. You know, I still think of myself as I was like 20 or 30 years ago, but I'm sure that <laughs> pe people who are younger than me, you know, he's 60. Um, I don't know whether... 62, 62. 62, 62, 62. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so could you talk a little bit about uh, the MEA? Uh, where yeah. is it? Where, where? How do people connect with it? What would happen in an MEA program? So um, MEA has both online programs, which is really helpful because we have people from all over the world who do those programs on navigating transitions, cultivating purpose, um, reframing retirement, things like that. Um, we also, and actually a work, uh, a class that's very simple called learning to love midlife, which, you know, is, is related to my book. Um, and then we have these two workshop centers, one in Mexico, in, in Baja on the beach. If you like the beach, you would like this campus because it's literally four acres right on the beach. Beautiful 
campus. That's what we started with. And then we have this huge campus, 2,600 acres, four square miles in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And our normal workshop is five nights long. It is um, focused on navigating transitions, cultivating purpose, owning wisdom, and learning how to reframe our relationship with aging. And um, it's about 24 people in a cohort. Um, and so you really get to know each other pretty pretty well and deeply over the course of five days, five nights. Um, and once you graduate, uh, you are part, You we have 26 regional chapters around the world. So you can connect with the people in your local area, but also your cohort, the people who you just spent a week with, um, have ongoing Zoom calls and conversations uh, and and exploring things. And, and I think one of the key things about MEA and why it succeeded is because <clears throat> sometimes the people who are your closest with in your life are not that motivated to see you change. <laughs> because if you're, <laughs> you're going to change, then they feel some obligation to change themselves and maybe they don't want to change. So to actually find a collection of people, two dozen people who you know, you don't need know each other's names, last names. You don't know, you know, your first names, but we don't talk about last names. We don't talk about, you know, your LinkedIn profile. I mean, it doesn't mean we, someone can't share that. It's just not part of how you get to know each other. Um, to actually get to know a group, group of people who, and talk about your dreams and your aspirations and get social support for people saying like, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, it means that you all of a sudden have some fuel that's propelling you forward that you might not have felt in the habitat in which you've been living. Um, now that's always an issue is like, okay, my gosh, I come back to from MEA. I feel so turned on. And now my spouse is telling me don't change. That's a hard one. And we have a whole program around that. But the bottom line is um, often we've seen quite the opposite. The spouse says, wow, you seem so happy and radiant. Like, what did they give you? <laughs> like, they gave you happy, they gave you happy pills. And, and the spouse says, tell me more. And I want to understand more. And, and that's when the spouse decides to come mm -hmm. and experience the program too. But <clears throat> yeah, it's, 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 a it, it's really important because we don't have programs. We have no schools or tools or rites of passage or rituals for people in their forties, fifties, sixties or beyond. Yeah. So what kind of, people come i mean so i assume that the person needs to feel that okay i i need some guidance here <clears throat> right that they need to be in that kind of mindset that yeah there's, there, there's it, something the, yeah the kind of people who come tend to be in the middle of a transition uh, of some kind career divorce parents passing away kids going kids leaving home um sometimes a health diagnosis uh, mm -hmm. and they're going through something and they're they're feeling like they they want to understand some tools that are going to help them go through this. Um, on the MEA website, <clears throat> you can it's called meawisdom.com is the website. You could go to the bottom footer of that website and you'll see something called the anatomy of a transition. And it's a an, a, a short ebook that's free that helps people understand the transition. How do you go through a transition in any part of your life? So I think that a lot of the people who come to MEA are in the midst of a transition. Um, they're sort of curious about what's next in their life. They might've had a company and they sold it and like, what am I going to do? Or, you know, they've taken care of their husband and their kids and their parents. And now their parents are no longer there. Their husbands divorced them and their kids are not at home and they feel lost. They don't know who they are. They're, they're, their definition of their life is as a caregiver. I would say that a lot of people who come to MEA come because they feel like they need something to unstick them. They feel stuck and, and therefore MEA helps them with that. Right. So one question for you. Um, so can you share your protocol for being healthy so what, what do you do to keep yourself mm -hmm. uh i guess healthy but but also curious so <clears throat> on the physical side um i i i hydrate a lot water <laughs> um i do a lot of exercise 
uh, and that helps. My most important practice is sleep. And so I go to bed <clears throat> almost consistently between 8 and 8.30 p.m., um, which is really unusual uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of people. But for me, that's that's the time I need to go to bed because I'm going to wake up at 4 or 4.30 every morning, no matter what time I go to bed. Mm -hmm. And so I get I get a good sleep. I meditate every morning, and that really helps to center me. Um, so, so those are some of the practices that help me. Um, when it comes to my, the, what else helps me with aging is that curiosity, that, you know, that question of like, what am I begin, a beginner at in my life today? Um, that's a question I like to ask myself. And how am I investing in my social wellness? How am I can, investing in my relationships? I'm really, that one comes naturally to me. I enjoy relationships. I have relationships and I learn a lot from them. <laughs> so I feel good about that. Because your relationships are almost like a, like a, an insurance policy. So in the U.S., maybe in Hong Kong, you have an insurance policy for if there's like a natural disaster. Mm. You want property and liability insurance. So what happens in your personal life, in your life, when there's a natural disaster in, in your <laughs> life? Do you have the emotional insurance of friends, family, and people who care about you? who not only are going to help you through that time, but are also going to sometimes maybe, especially if the, the disaster is something that is self-made, are going to be honest with you, going to help help you to see some of your patterns. And I have a lot of people who do that with me in my life. Um, so yeah, I, I think those are, I, I think curiosity and an openness to new experiences are very correlated to living longer, healthier, happier lives. Are you the CEO <clears throat> of MEA? I mean, yes, you're you're running it as a chief executive yes. officer. How how yeah, much of your it. time does it time? How much of your time does it take? It does take a lot of time because we're you know we're a relatively new company. So um, so yeah, I wear many hats. I am a CEO. <clears throat> I'm a facilitator who teaches workshops. Um, I am a marketing person for the business because of my books and my speaking. So I better love what I'm doing because I'm pretty, yeah, pretty gosh darn dedicated to it. Right. Yeah. It sounds, you know, very, yeah, very, very busy. Uh, so, you know, I'm, work, I'm working on it, but if you, if you're doing something that feels like a calling, mm. it doesn't feel like work. And that's how I, that's how this look, I see, I see this. Okay. So where can people come to learn more about MEA, your work, your books? So um, the MEA website is meawisdom.com. Mm -hmm. And when you go there, you'll see there's a blog. And that blog is my daily blog. I, I have a daily blog, not a weekly blog, not a monthly blog, but a daily blog. Wow. <clears throat> a little microdose of wisdom um, that comes out each morning. Well, in the U.S., it's each morning for you. It might be in the middle of the night. Um, but yes, if you sign up for that, it's free. Uh, and you get an email from me daily. Um, you can go to chipconley.com. Um, to learn more about me. And I, I post my blog um, <clears throat> Monday through Friday at uh, my LinkedIn page. So you can find me on LinkedIn as well. You have a quiz for, I was looking for that. I couldn't find it. Yeah. Is it still up? And can you give me the link? It is. If you, if you go to, if you go to, yes, I'll, I'll, I can, I can give you the link. And if you go to, if you go to chipconley.com, um, mm -hmm. And uh, you, what you go to is uh, click on, you know, order learning to love midlife and you don't have to order that yet. And then if you go down, you know, scroll down, you'll see the midlife checkup quiz. And, um, oh, right. but I'll send that to you, Richard. So you can put it in the, sh in the show mm -hmm. notes or whatever. Yeah. The you get that. Yeah, yeah. 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 But that, that's how you find it. So chipcolly.com, click on learning to love midlife book, and then, you, you know, scroll down and you'll see it. Excellent. Then I will give that a try. Okay, Chip, uh, thank you so much for joining thank us you, today Richard. and sharing your wisdom. Yes. No, I, an honor to be with you. Thanks thank for you. what you do. Thank you.